Welcome to Home Multimedia and Automation Systems with GStreamer. Jan, entertain us. Um, so I'll start with the home automation bit, which I think is a dream for a lot of people here, possibly a reality for, for some, and for me has a few connotations around how I think a, a, an automated smart home should work, most of which you've probably seen if you've ever watched an Iron Man movie. Um, I think they captured the essence of what people envision as a, a smart home, a thing that's you know, smart enough to be aware of your needs without you actually needing to tell them smart enough to control the appliances around your house and turn them on or off, smart enough to tell you when something is not normal, and context aware, they, you know, they, they're watching you, but not in the creepy surveillance sense that we've all become so used to. They're, they're monitoring you at all times to know what your needs are, but they're not sharing it. So there, there's, a, there's a word missing there, which is also trustworthy. And I don't think any of our existing home automation commercial solutions are like that. And there are a few big players in that field that, um, that you, you'll all know as well. The Google Home, Google Assistant version, the Amazon Alexa uh, smart boxes, the Apple Siri HomePod ones, they all do pretty much the same thing with various, you know, that one doesn't work with that device. This one only. This one does an extra thing, but you, you can't you can't put them together in the same house. They don't talk to each other. Everything is a, an isolated silo of functionality, both in the you know the ecosystem you choose to use. I know people that have Google Homes and Alexas in, so that they can in their house, so that they can access bits of the of both silos. But otherwise, there's no interaction between them. And more than that, the devices and the integrations that they talk to are all closed silos as well. They, there's, there's as yet no standards for, um, well, one, uh, one that I've been looking at lately, I, I bought a, a smart vacuum. It has run around my house and using its distance sensor, it has built quite a good map of my house that it can show me on the phone, and it sent it to someone in China, because that's what they do. But I can't get that map out, except to, to take a screenshot of my phone. There's no API for me to use that bot to tell any other appliance in my house what my house looks like. So they're not that smart yet. And worst of all, they're all cloud-based. They're all sending my data somewhere else, unless you work hard to prevent it. But then if you do prevent it, you're cutting yourself off from some of the functionality they offer. And I think that's a terrible place for us to be going design-wise as a society, as a civilization. So we need to do what we do at Linux, ConfAU, and in the free software community, and that's to innovate bits of free software and build our own competing ecosystem where we know what's in the box and we trust it and we built it and we can modify it and we can add these sharing features if we want. And there's a bunch of keywords I threw down on the slide as well. You could add more and build word clouds around these, these things. There's, uh, but to my mind, there's the, these high level projects that we really ought to be supporting and watching. The Mycroft Smart assistant that is going to be, you know, I think is currently the best candidate for our competitor to Siri and Alexa and Google Assistant. Runs as a stack of Python on a, a device of your choosing and has extensible skill sets that you can add your own integrations by writing a Python module. And people are doing lots of those and they, they're stored in GitHub. And um, that's great. It, de it then depends on a few features. So Mycroft works by recording your voice 
sending it to them. Well, first, they're listening for a hot word, so that's your privacy constraint. They, they locally recognize you saying, hey, Mycroft. And that triggers it to start to wake up. And then your audio is being sent somewhere else for recognition, generally. That's configurable. But the default is you use their, their Mycroft-based system where your audio is sent to them, anonymized, and then fed through Google's recognition. So Google doesn't know who it is, but they've still got a copy of your voice print from that. They're doing voice ID on it. It's still not ideal. There's the Mozilla Deep Speech project that's working on that problem to add our own open source neural net based speech recognition of that caliber, but in a, in a way that we will be able to run it ourselves on a nice machine in your house. So the, eventually, I think, we all should have that kind of level of smartness in our house and nothing should be sent outside when we're doing this recognition without our permission. So something like Mozilla Deep Speech, we need that for the voice recognition part. Then there's text-to-speech options, which is once you've got something to say, once the assistant has something to say, it needs to turn it back into audio to respond to you. And there's, there's multiple options for that all pretty robotic so far. There are a few of those that we can start to run locally, uh, though. That's, that's kind of getting there. And the, the options there, even the robotic sounding ones, they're much better, I think, than the voice recognition ones are. And then that, once you've got that smart assistant, it needs to be able to do things. So we have projects like Home Assistant or MQTT hand-built things where they can issue commands to your house and all of, the, you can, all of these devices that we can build ourselves around Arduinos and ESP8266s and ESP32s and all the other low-cost SOCs that have filled the market in the last five, 10 years that give us so many options. These, these nice Sonoff smart switches that have an ESP8266 in them, they have a Sonoff Chinese firmware in them by default, but they are well-known open design things where there is custom open source firmware, you can replace everything in that unit and own your smart switch and you know what it's doing. And I was at this point going to attempt a demo of Mycroft, uh, which I had running on a Raspberry Pi, but then I found while preparing the talk recently that the rest of my demo was impossible to, to do if Mycroft was running on that Raspberry Pi. So let's see if I can, what's it called? It's kind of awkward across one gigantic high DPI screen and a lower res projector one. So the problem I found on the Raspberry Pi was that I'm do, I have uh, these hats that I'll be talking about later on them, and Mycroft just didn't work at all through Pulse Audio with the hat on. Hey, Mycroft, what's the weather? No, PMI device, it's going to try and... Okay, so I did a last minute setup of Mycroft on my laptop to... Would you like to register this device? He's saying I didn't actually get as far as actually configuring... Hey, Mycroft, tell me a joke. Hey, Mycroft. Register yeah. by going right. to devices, selecting add device, then use the code P as in Paul, the number seven, X as in okay. X-ray. So, <laughs> I guess that kind of illustrates my point in any case, that even with a nice open source thing like Mycroft, the default mode is still to use the micro Mycroft.ai cloud and a new instance, you have to go and register it with a code there and sync it to their system and it's saving settings so that it can do its voice recognition. And they are still working on giving us the ability to run our own local <coughs> server instance so you can have an independent Mycroft device. There, there is also a, um, a limitation to this uh, this, this approach to home automation and had smart assistants, which is that I can put a Mycroft device in my house, but it will work on its own. So I have to choose where to put it to give it its greatest utility, or I have to put multiple ones in my house. But each of them is a pretty independent device that can control the same appliances and the same smart stuff in my house, but 
they don't talk to each other, they don't work together. And uh, the, uh, my idea of a smart house is that it's, all, it's distributed, right? Everything in the house knows what everything else is doing. And, it's for, and nothing is really doing that so far. They're, they're not working together. Uh, anyway, move, I'll move on here. If I can get my mouse back. Slide, okay. So this talk is also is, is about GStreamer because I'm a GStreamer developer. Uh, I've been a GStreamer maintainer for 15 years. So everything I do that as a, as a project, I tend to think of what can GStreamer do. So my focus here is, I've, I've talked about a bunch of projects that other people are working on, and I think they're doing a pretty good job for, for most of it. Um, but there are a few specific things that are close to my heart that I wanted to, to share, and the things that I'm going to show you are basically sketches in the, the direction of where I'd like to go. Uh, nothing is a complete product. Um, for people who don't know what GStreamer is, you've probably had it installed and used it at some point and then bypassed it to go install by a VLC, perhaps. Other people have used it extensively because it, it is useful for their, their job. GStreamer is a multimedia processing framework that underpins a lot of the multimedia apparatus in your default Linux installs. And the core concept of GStreamer is to build a pipeline of processing elements that do something with with some form of data. We usually use it to process multimedia, but not exclusively. It doesn't care what the data is, as long as you define some kind of, this thing goes to here and then gets processed and turned into that. It's, it's used for non-multimedia purposes as well. In particular, we're, pr we're proud that it's used by the LIGO Observatory to run experiments on the data they gather from the gravitational wave instruments and was instrumental in the discovery of gravitational waves. So they, they find it super useful because they can set up massive GStreamer pipelines to process the data from the LIGO instruments in different ways and test different hypotheses on the data. In, our, in, in the context of what I'm talking about today, I'm mostly going to be showing you audio related things. So GStreamer can do all the things you would expect to do with the audio, such as decode and encode, convert it into different formats, get it out into a microphone, get it out, an, out a speaker, change the sample rates, split stuff apart, join it together. It can also notably deliver multimedia across a network, either to retrieve things from a server and play them or to produce a stream and deliver it. If you were in Matthew's talk earlier today, then you'd know some things about how GStreamer can be used to do WebRTC, which is a, you know, the, the current exciting thing to do to get media directly into a browser, to share them um, in the you know, web future to do encrypted transfer of things. So I, the first idea I want to talk to you about today, this uh, idea of playing music. And it starts in 2012, this, this sketch, when I first saw a Sonos system in play at my cousin's house. And he had a, a bunch of Sonos speakers around his house and could do the music in every room thing or set it up so that he had multiple zones for the bedroom and move the sound between different zones. And I thought, hey, this reminds me of a thing we did in 2005 with GStreamer building a video wall where we were using different machines to play different pieces of a video across multiple machines. And that led to my idea of multiple network connected speakers, which is Pretty common today, you, you smart assistants can do this kind of thing as well, playing out each device. So this is my approach to this problem. And the key thing in this is synchronizing the devices across the network tightly enough that you, when you ask an audio sample to play, it plays out the speakers well enough that it doesn't sound like an, an auditorium. You think you're listening to a single speaker as close as physics will allow. And GStreamer has a very complicated clock management system that has been bred over the years as people came in with different use cases. We've added complexity. Uh, we have a classic diagram of how GStreamer represents time inside a playback pipeline on three different levels. And then there's a fourth under, underlying that as well. We have, so the clock time, you have a master clock that is 
telling you when a when a particular moment should occur. You, you know, it's a, a wall clock, or it's the system clock, or it's a NTP-derived clock. We have what we call the running time inside the pipeline that you use to decide, given a particular set of buffers, what, how do you map that onto the clock to know when to play it? And then we have a stream time that is what is the logical time that you're reporting to the user from zero to the end of the file. And underneath the clock time, there can be another master clock from which this clock is derived, and it's clocks all the way down. And we have a mechanism for synchronizing clocks across the network. We have, in fact, we have multiple mechanisms for doing that. Uh, the ones that you probably have heard of, we have uh, NTP client, so that you can simply ask what is the NTP time of, of a particular NTP master. What is, you can use PTP, which is a successor. Who knows who's heard of PTP? It's less well known than NTP, but still, it, precision, that's the precision time protocol and is designed to give you microsecond accurate clocks. And we have the GStreamer network clock provider which was inspired by NTP and has been around for quite a long time. And they all use some basic approach to the, same, the problem of you have a client that wants to synchronize its clock across the network so it sends a message to the master, what is the current time? and the master sends you back a response, and then by carefully observing when you asked the question and when you received the response and what was the round trip delay, you can derive some kind of approximation of the remote clock to within some accuracy that depends on your round trip times. And in the case of PTP, depends on whether you have ordinary networking equipment or whether you really care about coordinating your time, in which case you have PTP aware networking hardware that is modifying the PTP messages as they go so that the variability in the network can be taken into account. And we've tested these pretty extensively uh, in different scenarios. Our verdict has been in, in the end that we like the GStream and network clock better because it, it keeps things simple and in fact on, well, so on a wired network where you have fairly low round trips and very low jitter, PTP wins pretty much every time. You get easily accuracy in the, the microseconds range. As soon as you add Wi-Fi with big variability in the packet times or domestic Wi-Fi where you can send a packet and then it comes back a millisecond later and then you send another packet and it comes back a thousand milliseconds later, PTP does pretty badly just because of the way the protocol is set up. And a simple approach works better on noisy networks. So we can synchronize the clock. And then I have a thing that's called Arena, where we can, where I've built a control server daemon clients that are, um, you run on multiple machines, they synchronize themselves to the clock that the server is publishing and they talk to each other, they send JSON messages back and forth between each other over WebSockets and a web browser UI that is exactly as simple as I need it to be and hard, you know, it, this is not a fully fledged application but it does work well enough to prove out the concept. So if you'll excuse me a second while I just find this guy. Drag it over here. And I have a web UI that looks like this. And you can see that I currently have four clients connected. Pimiento is my laptop. Fuchsia 1, 2, and 3 are Raspberry Pis that are dotted around the room with speakers attached. They're all called Fuchsia because when I'm building my house that's a smart house, it's, I'm living in the Fuchsia. <laughs> that was my joke before it was Google's. <laughs> yeah. Plus, you know, if I, if, if, if I ever get an alarm from my house, I can say, great, Scott, we've got to get back to the future. <laughs> right. Everyone 
everyone can hear or something. <laughs> Let's do this bit. So there's one here. Hopefully that doesn't sound like got one over here. And there's one way up the back there. These are um, not the best speakers in the world, but they cost me five dollars each at Kmart. So that's might turn my laptop down a bit because that's really dominating the sound there. And we got some basic controls for. And in the statistics, it's giving me some information about how well synchronized the devices are. Um, I can turn that down so that it's not going to dominate the rest of the talk. And I sound distorted. So the, one thing that I've noticed as well, Fuchsia 2 is this uh, re-speaker core device here from Seed Studio. It's, the Wi-Fi on that is particularly bad at, at round trip times. Very variable. So that, that'll be the worst for synchronization. That's the error on that drifts out to five, 10 milliseconds pretty easily. Uh, if I plug it in over a wired LAN, that'll stay under a millisecond comfortably. It fell off? OK. Uh, which one is that? That's... How's that? <laughs> no, still more? All right. There we go. We'll just kill the whole thing. So Wi-Fi plays a big, has a big effect on that. Uh, but you can see there, even on this unpredictable LCA network, they, they stay close enough that it's, you know, it's not visibly echoey. And in fact, we can probably, in a moment, move on to the, the next bit of the, the talk. Ah, so there, this is just a basic sketch, right? Each, each device gets the, the music. It, it's fetching a file over HTTP to, to play it. There are other ways to do that, sending RTP to everyone. Uh, I've, I've experimented with RTP multicast, but then that's terrible over Wi-Fi, so we don't do, I don't do RTP multicast. Uh, I just send the original audio. And it has problems like when I skip to the next track, it has an audible delay while it moves on to the next track. It can do video as well, so you can run a separate client and have a video window on one machine and then have the audio coming out multiple ones. So you can have something on your TV, but then you can move to a different room and take the video across with you. Um, a part of the, this amazing UI that I didn't show is the way you can turn each one off or on. Then I can just have my laptop go. Add the one up the back, back in, and it'll pop back on after a little while. And so you can you can migrate the video or have in a in a smart house world tell it you want it to you want to keep watching that movie and have it move automatically to where you are as you go. That's you know that that's the vision that the house is distributed and smart. So that's, that's idea one, audio um, music playback around my house. Move back over here. Two, cameras. There are cameras everywhere. Gstreamer is good at video. Um, there are lots of reasons to have cameras around. Um, I have that up on the screen. That's not, that's not my slide. OK, that's my sheep. Uh, I like to check on my sheep. Ideally, I'd like my house to check on my sheep for me. So I'd like to have smart cameras that know what sheep look like, smart cameras that know what dogs look like. Uh, I've lost chickens to foxes, smart camera that told me the fox was there, or even a, a, ca a house that worked together to have a smart camera that knew that a fox was there with a spotlight that could move to scare the fox away. 
that kind of th thing would be good. So security, monitoring of my yard, someone coming in, I'd like to be able to intelligently record. And there are devices out there that do these, but I haven't built them yet. And GStreamer doesn't have any huge projects that do these you know, turnkey yet. There are nice cheap bits of hardware that can do this kind of thing. So um, lots of Raspberry Pis every, everywhere. All the professional delegates got one in the, their swag because they're just that inexpensive now. The first thing I did was stick mine in my badge and attach a camera to it. So that, that's, uh, I call that badgy. It's short for badgerigar. Um, and it's got a 220 degree fisheye lens on it, so it actually can see past 180 degrees. This is the kind of lens that my, I have a 360 camera from Xiaomi that has two of these facing in opposite directions and they can see far enough that it can stitch a full sphere out of the, the two views. And that's the kind of thing that it sees. Um, that's my three year old over it. He's been in daycare this week. And you now I had demo next. Okay, so I have a demo of streaming this and um, I thought, okay, I mentioned the GStreamer is pipelines, but it's probably not clear to, to people what that is. So I thought I would capture the pipeline that's involved in streaming to a web browser via WebRTC. Um, it's completely useless because it's way too complicated. So I drew some, the, every green box and every blue box and every red box is a, an element in GStreamer that is doing something, capturing the video, video from the camera or parsing the H.264 or copying it somewhere else or doing RTP level discussions across the network or encryption or decryption. So I drew some bigger boxes around the functional blocks. So there is the really big box at the top part of that, the, the sort of beigey brown on the video screen, this one. That is the WebRTC component and all the pieces that are involved in shuffling video back and forth across the network and encrypting and decrypting the control messages that are sent as RTP packets across there. And down underneath are the much smaller bits of, this is the camera capture part that, go, that takes from the Raspberry Pi camera and then passes the H.264. Uh, it has a little thread boundary there to split things up into multiple processing threads. We have a splitter that divides things out and then um, passes, oh, I forget what these are, H.264 pars and some, some other bits that then hand the video, uh, the encoded video over to the WebRTC bin, oh, payloader in there. Um, the interesting thing about, about this is that we don't have any encoder in there because this is the Raspberry Pi, which has a nice hardware H.264 encoder that keeps our, our power budget down. So I had Badgie running around. Uh, I recorded a bunch of video to consider either deleting or making a time-lapse video out of later, running off this admittedly quite large laptop recharging battery. Uh, but I think I recorded about 16 hours of video and used, well, it was still had four bars out of five available on the battery. That's, you know, not really using very much power there. Maria, I better go faster. All right, demo. So the goal with this is to take that video and just do a quick, couple of quick things with it. Sorry, it's a bit awkward having everything divided across screens like this. Shrink that up. And then go. That's cool. Hello, there you all are. Out the fish eye. I also had. So uh, the fish eye is kind of cool, but not that useful. Where is my terminal and everything gone? Okay, this one will do. Something around this. Let's delete my 
of time. That's not good. I didn't, but this will work better anyway. Okay, so here's the, the original video that I shot the other day. Here is, I can run this through the de-warp element and then that stretches the fisheye back out and creates a equirectangular projection from it. Not that, still a bit hard to view. Uh, and then I can, final demo line here, run that through a, which, that's the wrong command line. I need to put HMD warp there, I thought I tested this. Live demos, people. That's better. Okay, this is massive video. Oh, but it's sideways. Turn that around. Again. So now I can have a look around the, the video that I recorded. Yeah. Yeah. So the nice thing about that is you can pan around the video afterward and you can put it in VR goggles and you can have a look around. We did a nice experiment taping my 360 camera onto a DJI drone and flying it around my neighborhood and that's fun to watch in VR. You can just sit there and um, watch yourself floating above the world. Okay, so G-Stream pipeline. Um, what about the voice control part of things? So I had a secret plan for a long time after I made Arena to invert the operation that it's doing and use microphones on every device. Um, I've got, already got the network clock synchronized and the idea was to put a microphone on every device and then send the audio back to a central location to create a distributed microphone array that could pinpoint someone's location. And that's part of making my house context aware because what's better than understanding what someone has asked for is the context around where they were standing when they said turn on the lights, which room they were in when they said pause the music or move the, the TV video here. And I think if you have enough of these things around the house and you trust them, then you can do really interesting things, like even un, you, know, you can figure out which way was a person facing, what were they looking at at the time that they said to do something. Uh, who knows what a microphone array is? Got a few hands and then a few down. So a microphone array is, is you've got one in your phone. These days, if you have a smart device, you've got one at home. The idea is that you place multiple microphones into a device that are where you can correlate the signal that is being received by each one. They're sampled at the same moment. So you can tell from when the audio arrives at a microphone, so there's three in that example, you have an audio signal coming in from the side and the audio will arrive later at the left-hand microphone compared to the earlier one. So you can do delayed calculations to figure out which direction is someone standing and what, uh, so you can, you can do which direction, which elevation 
they're coming from depending on the configuration of your microphone array. And so I was trying to do something like that with my first attempt at doing this in 2015. And what I did was get a bunch of Android devices and put Arena on those, use the microphone on the Arena, on the, the Android devices, and send it to a library that I found called Many Years, which is written by, among others, Jean-Marc Vallin, who uh, we've seen here at LCA in previous years. He's one of the main Ziff codec guys who gave us the Speaks codec and worked on Opus. And it's designed, Many Years is designed to do what they, what they call audition so, and work on robots. And it was designed for robots that have a fixed grid of eight microphones. So it specifically did eight microphones. And it can do localization of a, the direction that the sound is coming in from. Uh, it can track someone moving. And it can separate out individual sound sources. So you can isolate someone speaking from the TV that is also playing in the room and pick their voice out of the noise. So that's pretty critical for for doing good voice recognition. Now, the principle is based on the speed of sound. And there's a, for, there's a simple formula for giving you an approximation to the speed of sound based on the temperature of the room. But it, you know, for our purposes, it's about 343 meters per second at 25 C, uh, 20 C, uh, you know, roughly room temperature. So a millisecond of travel is about 30 centimeters. So every millisecond of error in my clock calculations means you lose 30 centimeters of accuracy, but that's okay if you can place someone in a room in a three millisecond or five millisecond grid, that's you know a meter, meter and a half, that's pretty good for figuring out which room they're in and roughly where they are in the room. The result of my first experiment was an abject failure. Uh, it just didn't work at all. And there were a couple of problems. One, uh, I could use fewer microphones. Many ears could cope with that. But it really depended pretty heavily on you knowing the geometry of the, the thing and having the timing of the samples be quite reliable. So that variability in the clock was a killer. But also worse, it turns out that Android is really terrible at capturing audio uh, and trying to tell you when it was captured. It can capture it and synchronize it to a video and give you a nice recording to your disk so you can do a selfie. But it can't tell you the exact time that an audio sample was captured with any kind of reliability. Every time you ask it to start a recording, it can start anywhere in a, a window of, I found, 100 milliseconds, which is just a, a killer. And it's different on every Android device. And every Android device started recording at a different phase. There was just no way to make it work. However. For this IoT conference, I wanted to revisit the idea because since then, there has become a, available these open source designs and hats for Raspberry Pis that have microphone arrays already built into them. Um, and they're exactly like the ones that all the voice assistants like Google Home and friends have in them. Uh, the ones I've been playing with are from the Seed Studio re-speakers. They have a range of them. They have a six microphone, four microphone, and two microphone array that you can get as a Raspberry Pi hat. And they have this standalone re-speaker core that has six microphones in a ring and a built-in ARM processor with MMC and Ethernet and Wi-Fi and HDMI all built in. So that's basically ready to be a home assistant in a box with the right bit of software on it. And in fact, Ken comes with tutorials for how to install Alexa and Google Assistant and things on it. OK. Uh, then I also found that since then, then many years has been superseded by the same people at the same university, not quite the same team, but they came, they've produced a new one that is much lower level and much more flexible called ODAS. And again, if I can do some things without wasting too much time that I'm running out of here. Um, sorry? Speaking of which, five minutes to go. That's not it. Where did all my terminals go? So Fuchsia 2, where are you? Let's see. It's also um, a problem at LCA that no one does they block all of the 
MDNS announcements on the network for sensible reasons uh, that are based around the fact that when you have a thousand people doing MDNS announcements, well, at LinuxCon Europe, they had failed to block MDNS requests, and I found that it was chew that Avahi was chewing 100% CPU just processing announcements from other people's laptops. All right, so this is the ODAS web that's popped up on the other screen, because why not? Where is it? Here. You can't see a thing. Okay, and go back over here, and on the future I'll start the stream, and if that starts, right, okay, there it's connected, hooray. Okay, so that is now, Recording this. This is this is not G Streamer. This is just the basic ODES demo. So this is the six microphones on there tracking me as I move around in the room and separating me out. And if uh, Anna, uh, John, do you want to talk as well? Then we should hopefully see that uh, there, there's another dot. Talk a bit louder. I'll talk. Or I'll talk a bit quieter, and then you can. Hello. Yeah. I'm then the you. Can. Okay. There we are. You're from the front row. You're the blue dot on the other side of me there. Um, and it'll track those, so they're, they're, you can see the blue line in the graph showing elevation and azimuth to John and to me. And as it's doing this, it's also saving out a raw audio file on the SD card that has our voices now split into channel one and channel two. So I could now, I won't because I'm running out of time, but I could retrieve that file from the the device and then play it for you. So that's kind of cool. And that gives you that all those things I talked about from that library. It gives you the direction and separates out individual people. It can't tell how far away they are, though, because of a thing called the far field effect, where once you're far enough from the microphones, your angle to you becomes similar enough that it can't triangulate you very well. So when you're close, you can get you know two microphones and two microphones, and you can triangulate someone's position, but once you're far away, it can't tell the distance. So there's still a thing that I would like to do. I did the demo. A thing that I would like to do with Arena now is to have these multiple microphone arrays on different devices and for them to talk to each other to say, hey, I heard them from there. I heard them from there. They must be standing here. So we can use their arrival direction to position someone again. But it depends on knowing where the speakers and the microphones are relative to each other still. So there's still this problem of calibrating the position of people. There's also problems around um, if I play the same sound out multiple speakers, then the microphone arrays will be very confused because it sounds like the same noise, but now it's coming from multiple places. It can't correlate those samples very well. So that's, that's a, a very hard to solve problem. Um, I have this calibration thing in, that I built as a, a toy again. Uh, here, Google Chrome. You can't, uh, you can't see, you can't see this doing it. But you go, I ask. No, nope, that's not playing anything. All right, that demo is not going to work. That was supposed to play out a little. Oh, it helps if I turn on the speakers. No, no, all right, forget that demo. So I have, I have built this first piece of a calibration thing, which is each node can play a noise and then listen to hear that noise coming from the other microphones. Uh, but the idea is that the, to be able to tell which speaker each one heard, so each sound that they play should be some kind of identifiable noise that you can tell exactly which other speaker you heard so that you can tell which direction that was in. You can triangulate them off each other is the plan. Uh, but also, maybe they can't hear each other. So I have this question about how loud should you get while trying to shout at each other. <laughs> this probably needs some human intervention of what's the most comfortable noise for me to hear or some way of making a really loud thing. All right, stop. That's my time. Um, music that I played there is Creative Commons stuff. And there's some random links here to 
Oh, when I did this in 2015, no one had done anything like this distributed microphone array stuff yet. But also while prepping this talk, I found that in 2017, people have started doing this kind of thing. So there are some papers around it now. So thank you very much, Sean. Yeah.